everybody. Welcome back to We're Getting a Dog. Welcome. Uh, this is our last show of 2020. Wow. What a horrible year. What, what a year. Wow. Well. I mean, it wasn't all terrible. We did start done. this show and yeah. a couple other shows. That's true. But, It's really yeah. the highlight everyone looks to. For sure. <laughs> yeah. At least, I mean, for us. For so. us, yeah. For us, well, that is true. if you've been watching us and you joined us this year in our first year, we thank you so much. Please keep spreading the word. Tell as many people as you can about it. Bring it up at a party when we can have parties again. Do all that. <laughs> uh, we really, we do wish you a happy 2021. It's a very welcomed new year for all of yes, us. Yes, definitely. But um, today. It'll solve all the problems once it's a different year. Yep. The, that's how we think, I guess. So it's, we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> but today we can take our minds off all of that and just listen to all the information I'm about to give you on bloodhounds. Yay, bloodhounds. Bloodhounds. I've always been interested. The coup de grave of the hound. Yeah, there's another giant hounds. They are giant hounds. They're giant, droopy, cute hounds. Yeah, quite droopy. Uh, have you ever walked a bloodhound before? No. Oh, I, wow. I see them very occasionally. Nice. Uh, I do want to say for this episode, we did have some additional help in production. Well, not oh. in production, but in like researching and right. stuff. So I got to do, this is my notepad. I'm going to take this away from you. We did get to do an interview with a woman named uh, Adriana Pavlinovic. She is the first vice president of the Bloodhound, of, I'm sorry, of the American Bloodhound Club. That's oh, what it is called. Nice. But she's a very, very sweet woman. We talked on the phone for like two hours about oh, wow. bloodhounds. And I, you know, I grew up with beagles, so we had a lot to talk about just with hounds in general. But she was very sweet. She provided us with a ton of information for today's episode. We're very grateful to her and the American Bloodhound Club for letting us, you know, interview some of their people we're very grateful for that and she sent us some great yeah, photos of bloodhounds that are not like stock photos from the internet Ooh. so yeah we're very happy insider about that too. photos and i'm going to start us off actually with one of those photos so this one that she sent us is of an eight week old uh, sorry an eight week old uh black and tan puppies they're very cute oh my god oh they want the same they stick. both want the same stick <laughs> Remember, He's too, got it. if you want to see these photos, just watch our show on YouTube, guys. We have a YouTube show. It's such a perfect dog stick. Oh, it yeah. Is. All the audio listeners. We're just describing things to them. Yeah. We, so ne these we are never talk about them. Two cute puppies, black Poor and tan, audio arguing over the same stick. You can watch it on YouTube. Watch our YouTube. Uh, <laughs> subscribe to us there, too. We're just not getting a lot of traction. No, we, we, we love the audio listeners, too. Though. We do. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, we'll describe <laughs> these dogs for you. They're very yes. cute. So, well, I am going to do That's I am going to do the breed description. So, I uh, bloodhounds are a large breed of the hound group. Oh. And that is, they're most nice. well known for their droopy, wrinkly face and very long, soft ears. Bloodhounds are usually cited as the root breed of all scent hounds, which oh. is not totally proven, but totally possible. Hmm. Um there's a very long convoluted history of Bloodhounds we'll get to in a moment, but first I'm going to... A lot just, of bad blood? No, no, just lots of confusing possibilities that may be true, but maybe not. But we're going to start, though, with just the colors. So the first... Uh, oh, let me start here. The Bloodhounds have short, single coat of fur that is very dense, and it sheds once or twice a year. So they're not, uh, they're not hypoallergenic, but they are definitely... You know, they're you're, they're a hound dog. They shed. Yeah, do you all know, hounds have pretty much the same? I think coat? M most hounds have the dense single coat. I know that beagles yeah. don't have a double; they have a single coat. Um, but yeah, I mean, they just they shed. They're hound dogs. That's just how they are. They're very sleek. You Ain't know, nothing but a hound dog. <laughs> uh, they come in three colors, recognized by the AKC. The very first one, and these photos uh, are also courtesy of Adriana. Uh, this is a uh, I'm sorry. This is a different photo. Um, this is a one year old black and tan male. So that's uh -huh. the first official color recognized by the AKC. Yeah, really cute. This is like what I think yeah. of when I see when I imagine Basset or not Basset. I'm sorry, Bloodhound. Yeah, definitely. I usually think just brown all all the way, just entirely brown for sure. <laughs> brown all the way. That's what I think. Um, here's the Browner, next one. Go to downtown. 
There's liver and tan. This is not a oh. photo from Adriana. I did find this one online, but I, I wanted a puppy photo oh, puppy. on me. So wrinkly. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Got to clean those folds. Oh, yeah. Oh, yep. That's definitely a thing. Knows and then the get into. this is another photo from Adriana of an 11 year old red female who is a um, so the color's red. But this is a search and rescue dog uh, doing man trailing. Oh, but cool. I really like this color, too. Yeah, this is what I think of when I think of bloodhounds. Okay. I think maybe just because of the bloodhound they had on King of the Hill. We're Lady Bird. Lady Bird. Yeah, oh. <laughs> she's in Lady the Bird. famous bloodhounds at the end here. But yeah, no. So this is the red color. Um, nice, yeah, I always thought it was reddish. Yeah, the coloring can be interspersed with some lighter color. So sometimes you can see flecks of white on the mm-hmm. dog. It's okay if it's on the chest, feet, and the tip of the tail. Otherwise, it's not a it's not breed standard. Now, what is defined as the tip of the tail? It's like the top what? few inches. I think of the tail can okay. be white, but not the whole not tail. The whole tail. <laughs> not the whole tail, just the tip. <laughs> Okay, so just oh, the tip. Oh, that was... Oh, God. <laughs> you did that just to get me to say that, didn't you? N- of course not. Okay, next we're on to the body. Maybe. So bloodhounds range in weight from 90 to 110 pounds for males and 80 to 100 pounds for females. So wow. these are big dogs. Those are very yeah. big, bigger than I thought, even. And um, weight is proportionate to the dog's height. So you, yeah. um, when you, if you get a bloodhound, your vet will kind of tell you what weight class you're looking at for this dog. Hmm. Um, and I do have an image here of what the AKC illustrates as the standard. And they're pretty, you know, pretty well built. I mean, this is a quintessential hound. It's got, you know, the really strong hind quarters, kind of a tube of a body, deep chest, the thick neck. Um, so it's not easily jostled around. I guess when you have that big of a tube of a body, get pretty heavy. Yeah. Because beagles are surprisingly heavy for how small they are. Beagles are muscular there's i mean that's the thing is that these dogs are all muscle like they're not fat they're muscular they're like a wall of dog (laughs) Um, muscular like you know like a cow more than like mastiff dogs that look muscular in the legs sure like Like, uh, the one thing that uh i found was that bloodhounds carry a lot of their strength and how their weight is distributed and how their musculature is distributed around their body it's Mm -hmm. really it gives them the advantage um when it comes to like hunting down small prey i think bloodhounds were used to hunt deer and boar it's always boar at uh, one point so i think that's you know definitely a part of it you know how they've gotten so well musculature where's all this boar hunting gone did yeah, I dogs hunt all the boars i have away? a nordic cookbook maybe it was in here much I of boar know. hunting i have never days. had boar so. dogs ate them all they're too good. <laughs> They've got really strong hindquarters and backs. Their legs and body are squarely set. Most, m- like most hounds, are like that. Uh, and their paws also have a considerable amount of strength and weight as well. Um, this helps them dig fast. This helps them get things out of the way. But you know, they can. Hounds have you know the big hounds have big paws, and it's just mm, right. you know advantageous to what they look for and hunt for and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, basset hounds have surprisingly big paws. Yeah, they do. They're so short, though. Yeah. Um, So next, we're moving on to the head. So I do have a photo of a basset hound face, basically. Uh, This is a bloodhound face. I'm sorry. I keep saying basset hound of a a bloodhound. (laughs) Bloodhound. This is another photo from Adriana. Oh, this is the same photo I was using before. So this is of that uh, one year old black and tan male. But when you look at the face, they're really known for having this super narrow face right yeah. so they have narrow like it's horse. long it should be around 11 it, the median length is like a foot it's like 11 to 12 inches is the oh, median wow. length of their head yeah uh the eyes are deeply set and a really droopy face with the long floppy ears uh they should have a scissor bite but a level bite is also accepted according to the standard mm. so that's so no need to get invisalign <laughs> for your dog <laughs> scissor bite invisalign <laughs> Both accepted. Uh, the males should be about 25 to 27 inches tall. Females, 23 to 25. And then according to the standard, uh, a, a bloodhound of greater height is preferred. So you'll want, so they don't, like if they're on the shorter mm. end of the spectrum, they may not be best for showing. I see. Yeah. They're uh, especially large for hounds. They're very, they are large for, I mean, hounds get big. I mean, I think it's hard to believe because we just kind of connotate them so much with like beagles and you know yeah. basset hounds dachshunds yeah, you know, smallest all that kind of stuff. to become the most popular yeah, yeah yeah 
Um, their defining feature is probably their skull is like the, how long it is, mm-hmm. how it can, you know, it's really, they can smell like their smelling capabilities unparalleled. Right. That's what I know them for too. Yeah. It's just, they're like the best scent towns. Um, on the physical side, or on, I'm sorry, on the less physical side, despite their history as a hunting and pack animal, their temperament is extremely affectionate and they do not like to meddle with other dogs. Oh. So they're very friendly, love people. They're oh. actually kind of shy at first too. They're not like. The, they're not like in the like the bumpus hounds in a Christmas story that are like oh, raucous no. and crazy. <laughs> oh, they're actually, yeah. They can actually be kind of shy, um, and they tend to act out if their nose tells them to. Mm-hmm. So if they smell something, they're going. Just go crazy. Yeah. Um, Is and that then what I, the bumpus hounds were doing? The, well, they found the turkey. Right. <laughs> of course. <laughs> that was left on the kitchen counter for an well, inordinate amount accurate. of time. I've never heard of cooking a turkey, taking it out, and putting it back in the oven. I've never done that. Anyway. Sounds like a plot device. <laughs> Damn, plot devices. Or just a way to get salmonella. Turkeys Actually, she salmonella? says, don't eat that. You'll get worms. She does say that to him. So she knew. Uh, we're going to move on to their bark now. So um, I have three videos here. This first one is of just a regular bloodhound barking. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's powerful. Oh, whoopsie, I'm sorry. It's like an opera singer. <laughs> Vigado. Vigado. <laughs> okay. Uh, the next one I have is another one of a bloodhound barking. Just to kind of show you the different kinds of barks they have. It's very howly, though. <laughs> <laughs> so big I know and then I have a third video of a bloodhound howling like a like a legit howl oh not like an opera singer not like an opera long singer howl. bark howl <laughs> <laughs> oh wow it's like a whiny hell <laughs> oh. Aww. just in his chair yeah just lazing about howling it's actually rolled up just to fit in that chair <laughs> so that's those are the different sounds of the bloodhound <laughs> The many, many loud sounds. The many loud sounds of the bloodhound. Are they noisy a lot of the time? Like, uh, it says that they're they're they're. I mean, most hounds are barky. Yeah. This is definitely the one of the barkier ones. Uh, I I would say that you could probably train your dog to not bark because we've managed to do that with our beagles. I wonder what the loudest breed is. What's like the loudest recorded dog? One of the loudest breeds. I feel like it's going to be like a pit bull or something. Probably some dogs like that were that. bred to be as loud as possible. Like those, you know, those dogs that I think Great Danes were, they're supposed to bark when they find. Wait, no, that's smaller dogs like hounds. Well, I mean, hounds have a really distinct bark because they bay and they can, you know, yeah, they, like, that's like the a call. Is, so, yeah, they're bred to be as loud as possible yeah. I think, to, when they find the. I mean, beagles are loud. Yeah. I mean, Sydney and Wilson are loud. Well, Wilson's not super loud, but Sydney was loud when she barked. Yeah, those bloodhounds sound pretty Hers was like louder. a screechy one, too. Okay, so we're going to move on to the historia of this dog. It, this dog came from England and also possibly France. Mm. We'll see. We'll get to that. So bloodhounds have a lot of speculation and tall tales attached to their history. So it was somewhat confusing to decipher what seemed truthful and most likely, according to the evidence the sources provided. Uh, it seemed universally agreed upon that bloodhounds were most likely a common dog by the 1300s in England. Oh wow! So that's when like there's official somewhat evidence that that dog was populating in England. It's not the century of the plague. Yes, it was. The Middle Ages were magic. <laughs> That's a reference to one of my favorite YouTubers, the mortician. We're all dying of the plague, but check out this cool hound. <laughs> God, I hope she watches our show. 
I support her on Patreon. Anyway, uh, there's a lot of maybes as far as the early existence of the Bloodhound. So, an ancient Mesopotamia is known to have some kind of hound, but it was unclear whether or not it was the direct predecessor of the Bloodhound. According to, I think it's, how do you pronounce it? I think it's Alien, A-E-L-I-A-N. He was a third alien? century writer. Alien, Alien, I L E N. I don't know. Was he an alien? He wrote the Historia Animalium, and he describes a scent hound so dedicated and sensitive to smell that he couldn't part from his trail until, until, until he had figured out the origin point of the scent. So this could be a description of the early bloodhound. Even if the origin was an alien. Yes. Smell into space. Alien UFOs. That wait no alien Nazis. What's the History Channel thing? It's like the Nazis ancient were aliens. ancient aliens. Oh, I always think there's like a crossover of like the aliens and the Axis powers. There's no way they could build the alien the pyramids. There must have been aliens. <laughs> anyway, sorry. It's too complicated. Um, so this could be a description of an early bloodhound, and that that would make the bloodhound the oldest hound breed ever. But. Wow. Um, oh, and it would also make it a definite contributor to the rest of the group's development. So right. all hounds would have had to have come from a bloodhound. Yeah. There's not solid proof of that, though, but that's what's speculated. The next bits of information don't come around until 1066 when it was speculated that uh, William the Conqueror. Wait, or 1066? The first king, 1066. So it's back in time, right? This is back in time. Okay. This is, yeah, we're, we, went, we were in the third century before. Oh, I thought, oh, wait, I'm confused. I thought you said 1300s at first. Oh, that's just, sorry, that was just to lay, like, a baseline, that 1300 is when, like, official history oh, okay. of the dog really starts. Right, sorry. sorry. Yeah, I should have clarified that. So we're in 1066. We were in the third century, and now we're in 1066. Okay. So William the Conqueror has won Normandy, which is now France, and um, he has rule over the region while it's certain that hounds were brought over from France during this time. It's not certain if bloodhounds were a part of the canine migration to England. So there were a lot of dogs being bred in France by breeders, um, just, you know, that were being used occupationally. And those dogs ended up being basically shipped to England when William the Conqueror took over that region of France. It's the Northern region of France is Normandy. Yeah. So the evidence that backs up, this idea with William the Conqueror is that the uh, people who lived in Normandy were really avid and skilled hunters and they used dogs oh, to nice. assist them. And it's very much speculated that the bloodhound or the predecessor to the bloodhound was the dog that they used. Hmm. Um, there's also some evidence of possible French roots. There was a seventh uh, century monk in St. Hubert or Hubert, who supposedly standardized a version of the Bloodhound and popularized it in regions around Belgium. So he created the St. Hubert Hound or the St. Hubert Hound. But that's also, when you Google St. Hubert Hound, you just get Bloodhound. So oh. what I'm kind of going to infer from that is that the St. Hubert Hound was like just another predecessor breed. to the. It was like a bridge to get the ancient Bloodhounds to the modern Bloodhounds. So it wasn't necessarily a breed of its own. It was just a version of the blood of the of the modern bloodhound. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So I do have an image of uh, the St. Hubert Hound. Illustra it's an illustration. Um, but you can see it definitely lends itself yeah. to the bloodhound. Yeah, totally. Definitely with the tail. I think the tail is really kind of distinctive because when you look at. Yeah, the body isn't quite as like tube, how the tail and curves. The face and stuff. isn't quite as long, but. Right. Yeah, Ears definitely. Are almost as droopy. Yeah. This is also artist interpretation, so it's not 100% accurate. Yeah, it didn't look like it was going for realism, exactly. <laughs> so, the no next offense. the next piece of their history is their use for um sleuthing. So, sleuth hounds are also another term used to describe the early bloodhounds. So, um from the 13th century onward, so this is like the the 1400s. Bloodhounds were used for their dedicated scent capabilities and were referred to as the sleuth hound. So they basically they were used to tail people. Like really? if the king wanted to find out or if like a noble person or a police officer of the time was like, we need to figure out where this person's going. We think they're up to no good. They would set a bloodhound on its trail and it would lead them to it. Right. See that like police use bloodhounds a lot in TV shows. Like, yeah. Find, it's find really the, the same. 
Um, by the 1700s, the term was out of use. So no one's called them sleuth hounds. They were just called bloodhounds at that I mean, point. Sleuth makes them seem like they're sneaky. <laughs> kinda they're, makes them, they're like kinda, loud I kind of feel like they ha- they're like a detective you hire, like a private yeah, yeah, detective I guess like a or an inspector. Yeah. Uh, More like that. The last bit of information of regarding the old history of bloodhounds is the Talbot hound. So we've talked about the Talbot hound with beagles. It's just, it was a a, kind of like a breed of hound that existed at this time. Um, Mm. It was used a lot of the time to advance the hound breeds to where they are now. Um, It's really unclear if the Talbot and the Bloodhound were related because they're not really ever referenced together in anything I could find. Mm. Um, And that wasn't until, well, they they weren't referenced together until the Bloodhound was established already and Uh. being used. So it's likely that Talbot hounds were used to help standardize bloodhounds but again there's no specifics so the early modern period Ooh. in the 16th century a man named john i think it's caius provided a sort of standard to read the bloodhound by as well as giving it a name for its supposed ability to smell blood and follow it so that's the first idea of where we get the name bloodhound is that what they smelled though well, there's another origin story for the name, and that was its use as an aristocratic scenting hound or a blooded hound. So if something was owned by a person of nobility and it was used to, like, you know, do things for that, it was a blooded hound. Blooded? Yeah. Like it was of noble blood. Oh. Yeah. I never heard that. I mean, I, I, I would assume that it meant, like, these wealthy people, people of nobility were buying from top breeders. So it was probably, like, the you know, top tier of the dog, maybe either way. That's what Mm. they were called. And, uh, yeah, either, uh, Caius also provided descriptions of bloodhounds and further clarified how sleuth hounds were in reality, just small bloodhounds. So sleuth hounds, I guess were just a little bit like they were kind of the smaller of the bloodhounds that were used, not the largest. I see. That makes sense. Uh, The evolution of the bloodhound throughout the Middle Ages was staggering, and it set the breed up for its modern iteration. It's more specifically noted in some sources that the bloodhounds of the 16th century is where our modern bloodhound has descended from. Hmm. Uh, It's based a lot on illustrations and the standard that Caius provided. And then the modern bloodhound is still used for some of the same things that they were utilized for all the way back to the early Middle Ages. So they can still, they're still sometimes used for hunting game. They can still be used, you know, obviously for, you know, catching things that have been shot. I mean, that was another thing hounds were used for. Although they're not the fastest, but they are good at man trailing and, Mm -hmm. you know, using smell as their key thing. Right. Uh, Breeding continued throughout the early modern era. And then the French Revolution in the late 18th century uh, destroyed a lot of the breeder houses that kept the still called St. Hubert hound. So... It can, you know, the St. Hubert is basically the same thing as the Bloodhound. Yeah. Um, many people had fled to either America or England, but they found that the breed was useful in other ways than just sleuthing and hunting. So the, in England, the breed was heavily utilized um, to standardize the array of hound breeds. So Bloodhounds were seen as a way to, like, get the hound into these new breeds of hound which at the time were beagles foxhounds and harriers so right. i have some pictures of those just so you can kind of see where it came in so these this is beagles huh. so you can see it in the tail definitely the ears i think beagles have bigger ears than most other hounds and you know the face a little bit they're smaller but yeah, the pointed head definitely yeah and then the next is foxhounds which are you know, really good looking hounds are big and tall. This is an yeah. English fox hound. Um, and then the last one is the Harrier hound, which looks very much like a beagle. Just a little bit sleeker, I think. Mm. But I think it's, it's, it's shaped bigger. like a bloodhound, too, though. Yeah, it's got a little more like, like chest a head, to though. it. Yeah. So those are the three breeds that the bloodhounds were used for to not only help shape how the breed looked, but it also helped to enhance their smell because those three breeds are great sniffing dogs. And that really comes from the crossbreeding with bloodhounds. Uh, the industrial revolution and the new queen in England, who was Victoria, um, also really liked the dog and the Victorian era led to the middle class. So when the Victorian era happened, mass production of goods started that was the industrial revolution too 
And so a lot of people were able to work in the middle class and have, you know, it was when that, you know, income set actually happened. It wasn't just the rich stay rich and the poor are always poor. There's now a literally the middle class. Right. Um, so that's where that comes from, history lesson. Uh, so uh, because of that, bloodhounds became marketable. Okay, so they were endangered, too. I should have mentioned that. So by the time they were done developing the beagles, you know, done developing those breeds, the ne- the need for bloodhounds was kind of lost in England. Um, there were better dogs, faster dogs that did the same jobs as bloodhounds and could do it more efficiently. Um, but they ended up becoming like a collector's item for breed fanciers. Uh-huh. So what ended up happening was this weird marketability as like a rare exotic hound dog ended up repopulating the breed back into like relative popularity. So they're now um, pretty well known, but it's really speculated that had the Victorian era and the middle class never happened, b- uh, bloodhounds would have gone extinct. Oh, wow. At least that's what it really sounds like from everything I read. So, the, um, yeah, so they became popular and it rescued them, you know, from extinction. There was a market for purebred dogs, too. So these families that had the disposable income in the middle class, they could get in on the purebred dog action by purchasing them and having them themselves, maybe not breeding them. But it became like a fashionable... In the Victorian era? Mm-hmm. Oh, what, when was that? This was the... Uh, the 1800s uh victoria died in 1901 wow. and she became queen in 19, so like 1836 or 1838 so yeah oh, wow. it was like it's a long this time. yeah <laughs> but i mean that was a really important time that was when cottage industry stopped and that was when you know the industrial revolution happened and the steamship era started in that time too i mean a lot happened in that yeah. time and people had money they could buy these dogs and um Queen Victoria also loved bloodhounds, so she would show and promote the breed at her own events. I feel like every queen loves every British dog. I know. She liked a lot of dogs. She liked beagles, too. I'm very passionate about the following 16 breeds. (laughs) Her enthusiasm for the breed led to its first standard being written during her reign in 1868 by a man named Edwin Bro. And the American standard we use today is still very close to the very original one written in 1868, which I think is really interesting. Oh, wow. Uh, Bloodhounds in England have remained relatively popular. Then they rank at number 68 as in popularity in the UK. So it's not hmm. bad, but yeah. you can tell that there's definitely an avid like fan base almost yeah. for the dog. Next, we are on to America. Ooh, that's where we live. That's where we are. So Benjamin Franklin (laughs) was the first person in America to have wanted a pack of bloodhounds. And that was in uh, 1764. He wanted them, according to his own correspondence, to, quote, sent and track down the Native Americans. I think he used a more derogatory term. uh, Wow. Plundering settlements and kidnapping people. Uh, He got the bloodhounds, but I couldn't find any info about a bloodhound attack on the Native Americans that were in that region. Hmm. So I I forget what I, I forget what tribe it was. Well, Benjamin Franklin, you're actually kind of um, a sleaze bag. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I was never president. No, Ben Benjamin Franklin, Franklin, was, Franklin was president Benjamin though. Was president though. <laughs> he wasn't. No. He We're was. referencing the office. Who's the king of England? The, oh, the tyrant <laughs> King George the Third, of course. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so bloodhounds would unfortunately go on to receive negative connotation in the U S as a violent dog because of their depiction in Harriet Beecher Stowe's uncle Tom's cabin. So in the book, I've read uncle Tom's cabin too. In the book they're described, they're like the slave getting dogs. So if a slave escapes, they set bloodhounds on the trail to kill them. Mm -hmm. That's essentially what's kind of implied or if anything to bring them back. I mean, Mm -hmm. but that's, it wasn't a really good look for the dog, especially after the Emancipation Proclamation. Well, I mean, in Uncle Tom's Cabin, and that was like an abolitionist book, too. Right? Yeah. 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 So it wasn't a good look overall, probably. No. In the beginning. So, um, so because of the backlash, 
and the breed then just being seen as violent because then that was just assumed the dog was violent. Right. Uh, the bloodhound did not bounce back in America until 1888 when Edwin Bro, who wrote the first standard in England, brought some to America um, to an event that was hosted by the Westminster Kennel Club. I guess they had a little dog show in the States and uh, Mr. Bro brought his own bloodhounds. So what it, what was interesting though is that uh, the interest in bloodhounds was sufficient enough in the high tiers of society during the early 20th century that the breed was uh, kind of asked for in the United States. Um, a club was attempted after World War II, but it disbanded. Uh, so the current American Bloodhound Club was founded in 1954 by bloodhound breeders that were mostly located on the East Coast. And they were based in New Jersey. And then the breed's popularity spread around the country, leading to smaller clubs to be formed for the breed. Um, so there's like, if you look at the American Bloodhound Club, there's smaller clubs located around the country that do their own shows, do their own meet and greets, oh, cool. things like that. Yeah, it's actually really cool. Um, those were mostly formed in the 1960s and 70s. And they were made up of the people that went on to mentor the current breeders and showers of the Bloodhound. According to Adriana Pavlinovic, who helped us out with this episode, uh, she said that, quote, the 1970s to 1990s were an important time in making sure the breed was sound and going to responsible owners, end quote, in the United States. So from really what she and I talked about, it sounds like the American Bloodhound Club is very picky about who breeds their dogs and who receives the dogs. Oh, well, so good. people going in to look for this dog to be a guard dog will be turned away. She right. said that pretty yeah. outright. And I mean, this isn't a guard dog. Hounds are not guard dogs. Like, at least not this one. They're too friendly. They're too they're friendly. Just... Yeah, they're they're docile. They're not yeah. they're not vicious. Too and lazy. They're not they're not really smart enough to <laughs> I mean they can do search and rescue and stuff but guard dogs that's a very special type of training start sniffing the burglar <laughs> up and down pretty much uh, and the breed club has also taken great efforts to ensure the longevity and non-degradation of the bloodhound standard nice so they sound very aware you know it's nice to have talked to someone in a club that has control over their breed what it sounds from what it sounds like they you know they really crack down on bad breeding practices when you look on their website and if we'll flash their website on the screen there you go um as we do every episode uh, but yeah there's great resources there great educational resources um this woman who i spoke with adriana she was a teacher and she's also like the education coordinator for the club so oh. it was a very very informative conversation yeah cool um and also, oh, I should mention they're ranked at number 49 on the AKC's most popular registered breed. Oh, nice. So, yeah, I mean, not too bad. It's like I said, it sounds like there's a pretty good following for the dog in general. Yeah, relatively well known. Yeah, that too. They are actually we'll get to there's more famous dogs of this breed than I thought. We'll get to that. Mm -hmm. um, been around a long time. That's true. Um, first, though, we're going to do um, just some information about their training. So some of the specific things that they can do is deer and boar hunting. And that's what in their early history. They can do scent trailing. Uh, they can work for law enforcement for, you know, a scent dogs, drug dogs. Uh, mm -hmm. And they can also work in search and rescue. So, you know, this any dog that really has that strong sense of following a scent and, you know, being a diligent, like, worker dog... Are they the best scent dog? Do you know? From what it I sounds they like, were. they're like, yeah, they are, they have the best sense. They're the hound that has the best sense of smell. Nice. Proud that's of them. That's what the book said. <laughs> so. Every hound club <clears throat> claims to be the best. <laughs> Dachshunds actually smell the best. Oh, uh, no. They're too small. <laughs> so... According to Adriana, again, she advises that when you train your bloodhound, you should use treats. She described the breed as enjoying a challenge, but if they see no benefit to it, they'll lose interest quickly. And that they're also led by their nose and that their nose will get them into the, into trouble. Um, they're intrusive. She said they're intrusive and want to smell everything. She said socialization with other dogs at a young age is important and 
as well as obedience training up to the levels of an occupation. The AKC ranks them as like a middle of the road dog with training. So like they're lovable and friendly, but they're also kind of stubborn and may not want to do what you're doing. Yeah. So they're not the most difficult to train. That's good. Yeah. Um, Most hounds are pretty trainable as long as you, it it has to be like incentive based. Right. So uh, some other things, just some common questions here of like what to expect um bloodhounds are unlike any breed for them it's all about smell the work on incentive they work on incentive meaning that they have to have some kind of reward and that you know includes anything from training to you know going on a walk getting you know (laughs) even like tasks like where if if you want them to go with you you might have to kind of like bribe them (laughs) um they're the king of the scent hounds and they're inherently on a mission uh, Adriana referred to them as quote detective dogs. Yeah. So they like to have a good true sleuth find. Hands. Yeah, for sure. They do have some common conditions, uh, hip dysplasia, elbow dysplasia, all the dysplasias, mm. patellar luxation or dislocated kneecap and fold dermatitis, oh, which no. we have not talked about on this show, but basically it's just a skin infection and the dog's wrinkles. So you want to clean their wrinkles on a regular basis, uh, clean their ears on a regular basis too. Cause they've got those giant ears, um, traps can kind of trap dirt and gunk. Um, they also say that these dogs have the distinct hound smell and that bathing them won't get rid of it. What is the hound smell? Hounds just give off a specific kind of odor. That's how hound dogs are. It's not, I didn't know this. Yeah. It's kind of Doesn't just, sound good. I mean, it's not a bad smell, but if you don't, I mean, all dogs really smell. Kind of yeah, but hounds have a specific smell. People who have hounds will know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Is it bad? Like real bad? No, it's just kind of musky. And then, but it's like in a dog way. Great. <laughs> but bloodhounds have like the epitome of it. So, right. Um, and then just kind of some stuff about their uh, life expectancy. They live for ten to twelve years. So it's pretty decent, I'd say. Yeah. Uh, and their elderly years, bloodhounds are considered to be, uh, yeah, I would say so. Again, better than some of the breeds we've looked at this season. Yeah. Um, they're considered to be at their physical peak around age five. And then every year after that, you should have your bloodhound checked annually just to have an understanding of their health as they get older. They'll eventually slow down uh, and they may have to go outside more often because they, they may, may not be able to hold it. And as they get all, as they get older, always make sure that they're comfortable, that they get an adequate amount of exercise still according to their age and capability. So mm-hmm. you don't want to let them get lazy. Do they when need they a lot old. of exercise? They yeah. do. Okay. I mean, More than most walks. M- I mean, most hounds are sufficient with walks. Bloodhounds are kind of notoriously couch potatoes, too. Oh, yeah. I thought all hounds kind of were. Not... Not the littler ones. Really? Oh, I thought beagles and basset hounds were pretty Be- lazy. Well, beagles in later life get lazy, but yeah. in their young years, they're pretty right, active. Um, they cost around... This is... Okay. They cost anywhere between $450 to $1,200. And the average cost is 750 But I looked at the AKC Breed Club websites who are actually selling bloodhounds, and the prices are actually more towards 1000 So... I think it really is kind of what you get, what you pay for. Make sure if you are getting a puppy, go to a reputable breeder. Don't, yeah. don't, you know, don't go to someone that seems sketchy. Um, this is an interesting thing too. We've not talked about this. The first year expenses are averaged at three thousand a dollars. Oh, really? Why? Just for checkups, you know. Uh, um, okay, yeah. Like surgeries, inoculations, injury, inoculations, vaccines, all you know all that stuff that you have to do for your puppy. Cause you have to do yeah. multiple checkups for puppies too. And then, uh, every year. And that's also like food grooming. Well, yeah. All that kind of you stuff. General expenses. Too. And, uh, after that, it's about $1,500 a year in okay. annual cost. So that it's really is something I to think, think about. Normal dog expenses. Yeah. But a thousand. It just was surprising to kind of have a figure put to it, I guess. <laughs> Next, I um, well, you can always spend more on your dog, though. That's the thing. I mean, that's the thing. <laughs> you can that's, that's like them. the bare. That's like the average bare minimum cost. This is not what you know. Well, I mean, if you groom them yourself, and they don't mm, really need to go to just, a groomer necessarily, because yeah. most hounds can be groomed at home. But I guess it'd be vet bills more than anything else. 
it's yeah, just food, treats, toys. Food, food, treats, toys. Um, yeah, just like the all the expenses. There's so many expenses. Like yeah, yeah heartworm medications. You know, all well, that yeah, kind sure. Of stuff. It depends on the dog too, for sure. Um, on their intelligence, they uh, on Stanley Corin's list they rank at number seventy four. It's okay. a little low, middle of um, the pack, sort of. Sort of. That it makes sense considering that they're really easily distracted because of scent. Mm-hmm. If they smell something, that's what they're tuned into. Um, it's kind of intelligence, though. It is. I and can't that's, smell that good. It is. And I mean, Stanley Corrin's is mostly, I think, like, isn't it just like trick obedience? It's like yeah. obedience training. Yeah, like how many times like it takes them to learn a particular trick. For sure. I mean, these dogs, though, they're, they'll are they lead you to whatever you need to find if there's scent involved. So they're mm-hmm. definitely useful in their own regard, which... We see a lot of the time, you know, with dogs that are kind of on the lower end of the spectrum. It's like they have their own thing. Yeah. Um, they got it going on. They, they got it going. <laughs> I'm now just to the famous ones. We have Ooh. a few famous ones. The first one here is uh, Pluto. Mickey's dog Pluto really? is the a bloodhound. bloodhound. Yeah. He's so yellow. Yeah. I I mean, it's, it is a cartoon, but I, I guess. It kind of makes sense. He has really floppy ears. Yeah. There's also Bruno from Cinderella. What? Don't remember that. Oh, okay. <laughs> what about Trust from Lady and the Tramp? Trust. I'm not sure. Okay, I remember that dog. Yeah. Uh, the next one is the Bumpus Hounds from A Christmas Story. This is a picture of them surrounding the turkey. <laughs> there are four of them? I, had to s- I think they had more. I think in the movie there's like eight, but this oh, is wow. just in that scene. <laughs> Uh, Huckleberry Hound is ah. a bloodhound. I did not know that. He doesn't look anything like a bloodhound. He's blue. <laughs> yeah, it's not an official color. It's not. Well, well, no, it's not. Not that shade of blue. Yeah. Uh, Duke <laughs> from Beverly Hillbillies. Ah. Bloodhound. Oh, I mean, that's a real dog. So, I've never seen that show too. Me neither. Have you ever seen the movie Best in Show? No, I want to check it out though. Oh, it's there's about, a like Hub- Hubert, who's named after the Saint Hubert Hound. It's is, about dog shows, people, right? It's a documentary style. I think it's fictional. Yeah, it's like a mockumentary. Yeah. But one of them is a bloodhound that competes, nice. named Hubert after the Saint Hubert Hound. Uh, and then Lady Bird from King of the Hill, of course. Which this is the the meme oh. face. <laughs> <laughs> I had to use that one. <laughs> Lady Bird. And then uh, Copper from Fox and the Hound is also a bloodhound. Very, really? very oh. worried looking dog. Oh, I loved Fox and the Hounds. It's one of my favorite <laughs> Disney movies. I've never seen it. It's very sad. Of course it is. <laughs> well, that's all I've got. What you think? Oh, interesting. I really, yeah. I mean, again, we have to give a huge thanks to Adriana for helping us out. And oh, yeah. Thanks. Giving us history and the club history. It was all really fascinating to talk about but i really like that this breed is so useful like that's the one thing i think of is that it's used it was used for hunting scent trailing normalizing other hound breeds you know like it was used as like a is like oh sorry yeah it was used as a like a breeding breed a breeding breed yeah like it would make they used it to like help oh or like create other other hounds yeah yeah right yeah, it was very influential to yeah, other hounds, sure. which makes sense. It yeah. sort of looks like the general hound. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure if I would want one. Yeah, I'm not sure either. They seem lovable though, and yeah. one thing that Adriana did say too that I should mention quickly is that they do when we're not in a pandemic. They do have like meet the breed events, Ooh. and it's literally a chance for people to go and um meet different dog breeds and see how they like them. Wow, cool. She also advised uh, going to people's houses who own bloodhounds and kind of just checking out how their houses are set up to accommodate the dog because they're big dogs. Okay, and, you may want to know the people, though. Don't just well, yeah, follow don't just people. Show up. But, like, if you, have, if you have a chance, she did say that the breed club can um, find people and, like, find people willing to do that. Again, yeah, cool. not when we're not in a pandemic. Right. But, I mean, it's... Yeah, that she was super helpful, and it sounds like the breed is a really lovable one. So that definitely is good. Yeah, all hounds seem pretty lovable. Oh, yeah, I love hounds. But, well, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Uh, no, I don't think so. 
Okay. Interesting breed. Yeah, for sure. Well, everyone, thank you so much again for joining us this week on We're Getting a Dog. We hope to see you in 2021. We're going to be yes. bringing you new content uh, once this season wraps up. Well, we have one more episode of season two, and it's going to be Dylan's episode. I won't tell you the breed. We're going to be giving you guys new content, which are going to be mini sods on YouTube. We're really excited to bring those out in the new year. Yes. But uh, if you want to support us, go ahead and go to www.patreon.com slash we're getting a dog uh, you can get early access for just two dollars a month which is a super good deal and go ahead and check out our other shows on arcadia podcast network dot com dot gov dot org dot biz dot biz i forgot about <laughs> dot biz all right everyone thank you so much for joining us and dylan please take us out help control the pet population have your pets spayed or neutered Wesley Van Hoosen and Dylan Naylor are not pet professionals. Any advice regarding pet ownership and the responsibilities thereof taken from this program should be checked with your veterinarian. All episodes are researched thoroughly, fact-checked, and additionally researched during post-production. Annotated bibliographies of every episode can be found at we'regettingadog.com slash bibliographies. This podcast is hosted by Dylan Naylor and Wesley Van Hoosen. If you'd like to reach out or submit a photo of your dog to be featured on our social media, please contact us at WGAD at ArcadiaPodcastNetwork.com or on our Instagram at We're Getting a Dog. Thank you for listening to We're Getting a Dog from the Arcadia Podcast Network.